Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Am I being liked? Is it coming through okay? Yeah? Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm Rob Malkin. I'm a researcher here at the university. Um, I work in the engineering department in mechanical engineering. Um, and for the last two years, I've been working closely with some Japanese partners on trying to use some um, sonar and some acoustic systems to help them in the problems that they face in Fukushima. But I thought today, this evening, I'd talk to you a little bit more about the background to the accident, what's going on there, and what the future might be like. So hopefully not too technical and lots of pictures. So when we think of Fukushima, what do we think about? Well, we probably think about uh, nuclear power gone terribly wrong. We see some pictures of the plant, uh, which is blown up. It's the first thing probably comes to mind. Second thing we think about is um, the societal impact, protests around the world um, about nuclear power, Germany turning off all their nuclear reactors, um, a lot of discussions around whether we should have nuclear energy or not. We also think about the fact that large parts of the Fukushima area in Japan are out of bounds. You can't live there, can't work, can't travel. So that's another thing that we're, is in our mind. And the last thing is some relatively distressing ideas of evacuation and people being forced from their homes. Um, and I'd like to put all of these things into some kind of context so that you can all understand them a little bit better. The first thing I thought when uh, Fukushima happened, the accident, I thought, well, if it can happen in Japan, it can happen anywhere. I mean, Japan is the home of robotics, uh, the best civil infrastructure in the world. Um, you know, consumer electronics, digital imaging, audio, visual systems, you know, Nobel Prize winners in optical communication, the world's first 3D printer. So surely this is a, this is a nation of... Um, this is a nation of people. I don't want to do that. <laughs> nation of uh, highly advanced engineers and scientists. So, you know, what did go wrong and, and why did it go wrong? So, what I'd like you to come away with this evening when you go home is an incredibly short uh, overview of how nuclear energy works. Um, specifically, the type of nuclear energy employed at Fukushima during the time of the accident. What do you do to stop a nuclear reaction and how do you try and maintain safety when you have to stop a nuclear reaction? The earthquake which happened in 2011, the tsunami which then came and how that resulted in the loss of control of the sites. What happened afterwards in the first few days, weeks and months after the said accident? What's it like at the moment? If you were to go there today, what would you see? Then I'm going to talk specifically about when we go inside the most radioactive, the most damaged parts of the site inside the cores. Um, this talk isn't really going to cover too much of the environmental things um, outside of the site because it's not really my expertise. Uh, and lastly, uh, I hope you have an overview of how it fits into context of the way that we produce energy in, in general. So why do we bother using nuclear energy in the first place? Well, it's incredibly efficient. Uh, one tiny little um, amount of uranium oxide fuel, about the size of a pencil rubber, is equivalent to a ton of coal with no CO2. If you compare all of the mining and transportation, it's still an incredibly energy efficient way of getting energy. How does it work? Well, you start off with a uranium atom. You hit it with a neutron. It becomes unstable. Um, so it's about 140 miles northwest of Tokyo, the biggest metropolitan city in the world, 42 million people. So very, very close, actually, to, um, to, to Tokyo itself. This is Fukushima Daini. Uh, it was commissioned in 1982 uh, for the nuclear engineers in the room. Uh, four uh, boiling water reactors, 4.4 um, megawatts in total. And for context, Hinkley C is going to be about 3.3. So a pretty big, pretty big site. Fukushima Daini, it's about 10 kilometers to the north, commissioned in 71. 
with the very first boiling water reactors ever made. Um, and that was, uh, that's a little bit smaller in size. You can see from the aerial pictures, one is very different to the other. And at the end of this talk, you'll know exactly why. Now, if you had any faith in online reviews, this will end it forever. Um, Fukushima gets 2.6 out of 5 stars. <laughs> I don't know what you have to do to get a 1. I mean, if that doesn't do it, what will? <laughs> right. OK. Fukushi this is Fukushima Daiichi. This is what we'll be talking about. And I will refer to it just as Fukushima from now on. This is it in happier days. So four boiling water reactors, a large seawall in front of it. And you can see here on the, towards the north, this is where the water comes into the plant. And this is where the warmer water comes out. It's very close to the ocean. Um, and you could say it's probably a bad design to put it so close to an ocean in an earthquake area. And it's easy to say that now, but at the time it met all of the regulations that the government imposed on them. So let's uh, go into the nuclear core itself. Uh, it's a very old design, like I say. Should anybody in this room uh, remember when Harold Wilson was prime minister? That's when this thing was designed. So to give you some idea of age, it's, it's old. It's one of the first designs and quite complicated and not particularly safe. Inside the core, you'll find nine and a half million pellets. And those pellets sit inside rods. They're wrapped in a material called zirconium. And then they're bundled into a fuel bundle in the core. And that's really right in the middle there. And that core is about the size of a, of a, of a, tour, of a coach, something like that. Pretty small, a lot of energy. The reactor itself. Uh, a little bit bigger, and you can always tell it's a boiling water reactor because the, the control rods come in from the bottom. The fuel is sort of uh, in the bottom third, and then you have steam dryers, which improve the quality of the steam before you take them to the, uh, to the, to the turbines. And the control rods sit at the bottom, and you, we'll see a few more pictures of the control rods in, in a few slides. The other thing you have at a nuclear power plant is a spent fuel pool. So inside the reactor, you put in new fuel. It's in there for a couple of years. You get your money's worth out of it. Then the efficiency starts to drop. You remove it, and you put it into a spent fuel pool. And it sits there for a while, because it's still very hot. So you have to keep cooling it for you know five, six years, uh, more sometimes. And then you will eventually remove it out of the building. And one of the issues with a spent fuel pool is that it's considered out of containment. It's in the reactor building, but it isn't shielded quite as much as the fuel within the reactor is. Last thing is you have this enormous crane uh, which does all the operation. It refuels, it defuels, it moves heavy bits and bobs around. Uh, and for context, the size of it, uh, this is me at a plant in Japan, very similar in design to Fukushima. Uh, and that's the top of the reactor there. So it's not particularly big, but you can power all of Bristol with it and some. So this crane is going to come back. So it's good to have an idea of its size. The last thing is uh, this big donut. It's called a suppression chamber at the bottom. Uh, this big a donut is half full of water. And it's there to cope with very short losses in, uh, in cooling. So if the core gets very hot temporarily, the steam is released into this donut. Um, and you can tell uh, the design as soon. If you ever see the donut, it's a very, very early design of reactor. And there I am in the basement of one of these buildings, uh, again, for size. Uh, and this is a mock-up that's currently being built in Japan to help with the cleanup. Uh, last thing is the control rod area. It's in a place called the pedestal. Uh, this is me at the back and Professor Drinkwater. Some of you may know him. He's at the front there. Incredibly cramped, small area. Um, and this is directly below the control rods, which will regularly be moving out of the core. Now, some of the pictures in this presentation are a little bit low quality. And that isn't because I'm lazy. It's because the company that releases some of these, because you're not allowed to take a camera to a site, they take pictures for you. They take them on a camera from 1950, probably. <laughs> There's such low resolution. And it's mainly just to prevent the loss of the theft of in industrial secrets. So if you see a low quality picture, it's, it's not my fault. 
Right, so you have your reaction going. It's producing lots of, uh, lots of lovely energy for you. You're, you're generating electricity, and then something happens. You have an earthquake, or for some reason, you need to stop the reaction very quickly. So what do you do? Well, the original way of doing it, uh, this is Enrico Fermi in Chicago, and this is called a Chicago pile. This was a very early experimental reactor. And his way of stopping a reaction was to have a man with an ax and a rope. That was it. And he was called the safety control rod ax man, or SCRAM. That's where the term SCRAM comes from. So he would drop his hand to say the reactions run away. Uh, and then the guy would cut the rope, and then the cadmium plate would fall into the reactor and stop the reaction. Not particularly quick, uh, but it, it worked. Things are a little bit better these days. We've automated that process. So in Fukushima and in other nuclear sites, if there's an earthquake, that's automatically detected, and the control rods are inserted to stop the reaction very quickly. And you're about to see a video of one of these scrams happening. Quickly, a second or two at best, the reaction is essentially over now. However, there's still an awful lot of heat being generated by the fuel inside the reactor. So this is a graph of the temperature inside the core, and this is a time in seconds from zero to about a minute and a half. And the moment you insert the control rods, you uh, reduce the temperature very, very quickly. Um, however, not all of it. So after shutdown, you've got about 7%. 10 seconds later, you've got 7% of that heat remaining. Uh, and even a day and a half later, only 0.5% of the reactor is still the, the, the heat that you used to produce when it was at full power. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but actually 15 megawatts is a lot of energy to try and um, absorb and deal with. And that's equivalent to about 8,000 kettles boiling. So a day and a half later, you have to somehow remove that quantity of heat. And usually the biggest problem with nuclear safety, if you do have some kind of an accident, is actually keeping the fuel cool, as we'll see in a second with what happened. I would absolutely love to tell you, and I, I really would, uh, about all of the safety systems at Fukushima, um, and there's many, but I can't because we don't have time. If you want to know more, come and talk to me. I'd, I'd love to tell you. But they essentially have five jobs. First one is to keep the fuel cool. Keep it below 1,200 degrees Celsius. You don't want it to start to bend or warp. It's job number one, probably the most difficult. Number two, keep the cladding oxidization low. So the cladding is the material that you wrap around the fuel pellets. And you have to keep that oxidation down, because when it oxidizes, it produces hydrogen. And we'll find out in a minute why that's bad. So yeah, keep if you do have oxidization, keep the hydrogen production uh, relatively low. Maintain core integrity basically means don't let it melt, because if it melts, uh, you can't cool it in the way that you would like to be able to cool it. And also have systems to allow for long-term cooling, because you have to cool it possibly for years. If you have complete loss of the control of the core, you might have to pump cold water in. You know, Water is still being pumped into Fukushima to keep the reactors cool. So it gives you some idea of how long this stuff takes. Generally, it's divided into three types of system, high pressure system, uh, and that's kind of to deal with just very short losses in, uh, in cooling. You'll have depressurization systems and low pressure systems, which means you can just use uh, something like a normal water pump just to pump water into the core. You have one final last line of defense, which is called a core vent. Now, should the pressure inside the reactor core uh, be too high, you can ask, and you have to ask the Prime Minister in Japan's case, can we release the gases inside the core? Some of them are likely to be radioactive, dangerous to uh, people in the environment. If the Prime Minister gives his go-ahead, you vent the core, and this is what it looks like. You can either vent from that donut, which is a little bit better because it's a bit filtered by the water, or you can vent from the reactor itself. And then it will travel up those big uh, stacks that you see in pictures, and it's released into the environment. So 
you don't really want to do that, but it's, it, if you do want to do it, it's, it's a good idea because it means that you're unlikely to build up a lot of hydrogen in the, reacting, the reactor building, which can lead to an explosion. So earthquake, um, quarter to three in the afternoon, um, 2011, you could well remember it. I'm going to show you a little video of the time of the uh, earthquake, and this is filmed in Tokyo. So this is 140 miles from Fukushima, so it's probably 220, 230 miles from um, where the earthquake actually struck. That was just a few seconds for, in Japan. This went on for about half an hour in some parts. The plant itself shook for well over a minute. This was Japan's biggest ever earthquake recorded, fourth biggest earthquake ever recorded um, by humans. Um, and it did a few things. Um, it uh, damaged infrastructure, so part of the national grid in Japan uh, went down. The transformers were broken, the power lines collapsed, roads sheared in half, uh, train lines were buckled. So it's very difficult to get any kind of emergency supplies to the plant. Most of your routes in and out are completely damaged. And the thing that really um, was a problem for Fukushima was that the national grid went down. So they were without. Uh, what we call off-site power. They were not able to get um, electricity to uh, This is uh, what happened 45 minutes later. The video is sped up a little bit. Um, so this is in Fukushima, just south of uh, the nuclear power station. And then you can see there's still some aftershocks going on after the tsunami hits. The earthquake, sorry. And this whole process, the tsunami, doesn't last for very long. You know, it's in and out within a couple of minutes. But pretty significant damage was done as a result. And you can see it's going to start to subside now as if nothing had happened. So at Fukushima, um, the tsunami came and it overwhelmed the seawall. The seawall was designed at 10 meters. The wave came in at 14 meters basically destroyed everything in its path. It was incredibly powerful, uh, never designed to take such a large tsunami. Um, and like I said, they lost all off-site power. So at that point, they had to look after themselves. They had no electricity coming from the grid. This is where the flooding hit from above. So all six of the plants were inundated. At the time of the accident, plant number one, two, and three were operating at full power. Number four was being defueled, and five and six were under inspection. So they uh, were less of a concern initially than reactors one, two, and three. Uh, and that red circle there is the wave, which was 17 meters above ground level. So significant. This is how quickly it happens. This is some CCTV pictures, uh, which shows you between the areas between reactors one and two. So at 42 minutes, that's what it looked like. 43 minutes, that's what it looked like. And one minute later, all the water's gone. So incredibly quick process. And then a few minutes after that, as if nothing had happened. Except something did happen. And um, when the off-site power was lost, the emergency procedure was to switch to generators. So you have petrol power, diesel power generators, which could provide power for three or four days. Unfortunately, they were flooded. They were built below ground level, um, and the water completely inundated them. So at that point, you could say that the fate of Fukushima was sealed. Really, um, no power, loss of emergency power, and there really isn't that much you can do when that happens. Uh, this is for the people who tried to fix the problem. Um, all sorts of stuff in your office, that's a, that's a problem. Um, uh, 
loss of uh, power. So what do you do? Well, you get loads of batteries and you try and restore power to the emergency systems which tell you things like uh, internal pressure of the reactor, the, te the water level, the temperature. Simple but very important things. So firefighters got the emergency batteries. They only lasted for a few minutes. So then they ran around the car park trying to take out batteries from people's cars just to try and get some of these emergency systems back up and running. Uh, they tried to do hand calculations and keep track of what the pressure levels were like. Um, they also had to do emergency electrical uh, work. The electrical connectors between uh, plants one, two, and three were all different. So when they tried to share batteries, they couldn't. So they had to do stripping of wire and soldering and all this stuff. That is not the time you want to be doing that kind of thing. So things have definitely changed since then. Um, and I don't quite have time to get into it, but they realized that the, the fact that it wasn't universal between all three was a contributing factor to, to the accidents. This is what uh, it normally looks like, a control room. Uh, it sits about 20 people, uh, very clean, very tidy. Um, this is what it looked like after the accident. They lost all power, they lost all electricity systems, so it was completely dark. They resorted to head torches. Um, and also there was a very big danger of radiation release. So they had to do all of this wearing very uncomfortable hot respirators. Added on top of that is they had no phone uh, lines apart from one phone line into the reactor, into the control room. So they had no idea what happened to their family or their friends. You know, 18,000 people died during that tsunami and a lot of these plant workers lost friends and family. And they're trying to operate in this incredibly complicated, noisy, possibly dangerous environment. So I think we should give them quite a lot of credit for, for that. Um, this is them trying to find emergency uh, procedure documents. And yeah, not a, not a good day at the office. Uh, they were there for a long time, very tired. They were given the order to leave, uh, but 50 of them said that they would remain. Um, and in Japan, to go against what your boss says is, is a big deal. Um, so the 50 of them stayed at the plant to try and maintain some level of control. Um, what they did then was after the uh, earthquake struck, they decided to go and check on one of the control systems, one of the, one of the safety systems. And this is very noisy, there's a lot of steam lines that are broken. Uh, they can't hear what, whether this emergency system is working or not. And to their criticism, they also didn't know whether the safety systems were working or not, because they've never seen them working. They've never actually tested some of their emergency safety systems. OK, so what happens? You get the earthquake, automatically you do the scram, so the reaction stops. Then you lose off-site power. It's no big deal, we've got emergency generators. Well, it is a big deal because they're flooded a few minutes after that, so now you have no power. But you have uh, safety systems, passive systems, which will cool the core. They're only designed to cool the core for a few hours. Um, so then, soon after, they failed. And unit 1 was the oldest reactor. Uh, it had the most basic safety system, so that one failed first. Then it, the core is uncovered, and that basically means that all the water boils off. And now you have a reactor core with no cooling at all. Soon after that, the cooling systems in units 2 and 3 failed. Then you have a last ditch attempt. You spray the core 20,000 liters a minute of water into each core just to try and cool it for a little while. But these are only designed to last maybe an hour or two at the tops. At that point, all the cores are uncovered and you have no cooling whatsoever. Then you have uncontrolled heating. The core is still very hot. You have decay heat from the, the fission process and they start to get hotter and hotter until they reach 2,800 degrees. That's the melting point of uranium oxide. And this is an animation of what that melting looks like. Not too dissimilar to a, a candle dripping as it, as it burns. So the fuel is going to settle at the bottom of the reactor core. It's going to eat through the reactor, um, the reactor shell, and it's going to spew out. It's either going to spew out or it's going to spray out. Now, if the pressure inside is quite low, it's going to spew out like a big blob, possibly. If it's high pressure, it's going to spray out under very high pressure, and it's going to go absolutely everywhere. And nobody quite knows which one of those two happened. 
The other thing that you have is this zirconium, this uh, fuel that you wrap in, in this cladding. At high temperature, it starts to react exothermically with the water, and you produce hydrogen gas. Uh, hydrogen gas is explosive, and here's a little uh, copy of live news from the BBC. It's not an amazing video, and there isn't actually very good video at all of the re uh, explosions happening, and this is as good as I could find. So. An explosion was heard and smoke seen at the power plant this morning, and uh, here it is. Wow. So this happened uh, three times, um, spewing a lot of radioactive material over the immediate site. So at this point, if you've been paying attention, you'll be wondering why didn't they vent those hydrogen gases from the reactor core in the reactor building? And I'm going to read to you a little something. So this is Prime Minister Khan, Prime Minister of Japan at the time, talking to TEPCO. And TEPCO is the Tokyo Electric Power Company, and they were in charge of the site. And Prime Minister Khan says, TEPCO said it wanted to do venting. So I told TEPCO to do it, but it didn't. I asked why, but there wasn't a reply. I thought things would go wrong if they kept going on like this. Uh, site Chief Yoshida, the guy in charge of the site, this chap here on the right, he said, we will do the venting, we will do it even if we have to form a suicide corps. There was a discussion that they would choose some individuals, hopefully they would volunteer, to go into the most radioactive part of the building, possibly receiving a lethal dose of radiation to manually release the vent. Pretty sobering idea to be... Uh, to even consider doing that. But it didn't happen. They didn't vent. And the reason is that the venting system works generally quite easily uh, when you have power. Without power, you have to do it manually. Manually is difficult because you need compressed air generators. And also, you need instructions on how to do it. They didn't know how to do it because they'd never seen the manual plans. They had to go to the administration building. They had to look through 10,000 pages of documents to find the electrical diagram to tell them how to vent. So they never test, they never even considered the idea if we lose all power, how do we do these emergency uh, procedures? This happened, these are some pictures of the morning after. Um, so that those explosions, incredibly energetic hydrogen gas is the most uh, energetic, is, has the highest calorific content of all, uh, nat all gases and, and uh, liquids, petrol, diesel, what have you. Very, very explosive. Then it blew the top of the building off, and three of them. This is reactor number four. Uh, I've been to buildings like this, a few of them. They are incredibly well built. You know, the walls are a good three, four meters thick. Uh, you know, when I first saw these pictures and then I, I, I went to the site, I was really blown away just about how powerful these explosions are. And if, uh, if you've been paying attention, you'll notice this is reactor number four. Reactor number four was defueled at the time, so why did it explode? The reason it exploded was that reactor number three and reactor number four, they used to use the same vent line. So if either of them had to vent the reactor core, they'd use the same pipe. And what happened was that the gas from unit three came across into unit four, rose to the top of the building, and then exploded. So this is a section of the wall. Again, really, really powerful stuff. The other thing that they, um, the, the other thing that possibly ha did occur in Fukushima, and nobody knows for sure, is a thing called a steam explosion. The steam, ex steam explosion happens if you have a, a hot uh, liquid, usually if you have a hot metal in a liquid form and you put it into water. What happens is that water boils very quickly and it becomes quite an explosive mix. You vaporize that water almost instantly. This is a little video from Sandia National Laboratories in the US, and what they were doing, they were simulating this. They wondered, well, what would happen if we had a reactor meltdown, and then we'd been trying to cool it, and there was water in the basement, so then this hot fuel fell into a big pool of water. So they didn't use uranium in this experiment. For obvious reasons, they used some lead, but it's a pretty similar physical process. So here's the molten lead being released from the top. And here you'll see it fall into this bucket of water. The 
this may well have happened in Fukushima. We don't, we don't really know. Um, it's, it's, it's possible, uh, but to be determined. Um, and just for historically, this was one of the biggest concerns that they had in Chernobyl as well. They were worried that a huge amount of the nuclear fuel that happened in Chernobyl might also fall into a large pool of water. So, and the problem with this is that it's such a violent explosion that it would scatter a lot of material in a very large area because the containment structure possibly might not be able to deal with an explosion that big. Uh, so the day after, uh, these are the initial dose measurements. So the, the people who were working on the site, they quickly went to evaluate where the most radioactive areas of the site were so that you would and wouldn't go somewhere. They would carry red spray paint with them. And if they happened to find something particularly radioactive, they'd circle it in red paint uh, to tell you to remove it as soon as possible. Uh, so this is uh, an access door here to some electrical uh, plant room inside the building. Can't get into it. So this impeded a lot of the, the rescue efforts that they, they had. They couldn't get stuff uh, delivered by boat either because the access ramps were completely damaged. So even if you tried to get some fire trucks from further down the coast or further up the coast, you couldn't land them on the beach. And they, in their desperation to cool the core, they used seawater. The problem with that is that nobody's ever done it before. Nobody really knows what happens when you mix seawater in a, in a very hot reactor. And also the fire trucks weren't powerful enough to suck up such a huge amount of water. But maybe the explosions actually weren't all bad. Um, this is the spent fuel pool of unit number four. And in, in here you've got uh, about five or six years worth of spent fuel just sitting in the pool, being kept cool. And if you don't actively cool that water, the water is going to start to boil and it's going to evaporate. And if it evaporates, you're going to expose all the fuel in the spent fuel pool. It's going to melt. It's going to catch on fire. And then you've got a huge disaster because it's directly into the atmosphere. There's no containing that spent fuel. But there's a great big hole in the side of the building, so you can pump water from a from a fire truck or from one of these uh, concrete pouring machines. So they were desperately pumping water into the spent fuel pool to make sure it was topped up. Had the building not have blown up, uh, it's quite possible that that wouldn't have been possible. And there may well have been a fire in the spent fuel pools as well. Immediately after, uh, there was some radiation mapping done by the American military. They flew uh, Black Hawk helicopters up and down the prefecture, taking dose measurements, trying to evaluate where is this radiation going and should we be concerned about a particular area more than others. On the day of the accident, 90% uh, of the fuel which was ejected uh, fell into the ocean and then the wind changed and about 10% was taken inland. And Professor Tom Scott at the university here, he's done a lot of work on this, on this mapping. So what they decided, they decided to um, evacuate. Their evacuation procedures were very poor. The people at TEPCO didn't even know what the emergency procedures were. They had to go and check all of their internal documents to find them. And they were criticized heavily by the IAEA um, ab about how bad their evacuation procedures were. But anyway, um, the other thing they did uh, in the sort of weeks and months afterwards, they decided to scoop up 10 centimeters of soil uh, in a large area of Fukushima and put it into these enormous bags. <coughs> um, each bag is about this big. I think it's probably about a ton. And there are absolutely thousands of them. Uh, and they don't really know what to do with them. And every time I go back, there's more. And they seem to uh, just move them from one place to the other. Um, I think they're just going to leave them there. But... <laughs> Again, that's another one to be determined. It's actually, part of it is actually to be seen to be doing more than it actually does. It's actually not a particularly effective way of cleaning up um, a contaminated area. So let's put some of these radiation levels in context. Uh, the background level of radiation in uh, Bristol, it's about 0.18. This is pretty normal for most cities in the, in the world. Uh, this is Hiroshima, so this is... Uh, was now 70 odd years after the dropping of the first atomic bomb. A little bit higher, not, not much higher, this is perfectly fine. Mary Curie's laboratory. Um, what, I'm, I'm sorry to say I don't know how, how long ago she died, but it's a while, 70, 80 years or something. So after all of the work she's done, it's, it's 
a little bit more radioactive. You may be concerned, but you shouldn't be really. The other thing is um, when I fly to, well, when any, any of you fly at high altitude, you're exposed to radiation uh, from the sun and the atmosphere um, blocks it out at ground level, but when you're higher up, it doesn't. And at peak levels, you get about around three microsieverts an hour. So that's normal places. This is in Japan. This is me and Bruce. Uh, this is about 10 kilometers from the site. Uh, so about the same as Bristol. We weren't particularly concerned. We were then on a bus on our way to Fukushima, and we happened to drive through one of the areas which had a higher percentage of fallout. And the level is a little bit higher. Uh, and this is where people can't live. So these areas are, are sort of restricted, but you can drive through them. You can't walk and cycle through them, but you can, you can drive through them. This is about 100 meters from the reactor uh, cores themselves, so really, really close. But it just so happened that when the radiation was released, it went up and then fell. So underneath that arc, there's less radioactive fallout than you might think. Finally, this is the highest dose I was exposed to whilst I've been there, and I've been there a few times. Um, so it's 250. Sounds like a lot. Uh, but actually, when we compare it to the amount of radiation you receive, it's not that high. So when I fly to Japan, it's a 12-hour flight there and back. And during that time, I maybe receive up to 70 microsieverts. I'm only at Fukushima between the... This is reactor building number uh, one. I'm only there for about a minute. So I actually receive a very small amount of radiation whilst I'm, whilst I'm visiting. So flying to Japan is much worse for me. It isn't worse because none of these levels are particularly dangerous. But I receive more radiation going there than when I actually get there. Uh, there's a beach in Brazil uh, which has a background radiation level of 150. So to put it into some context. So there you are, reactor number two, reactor number three. You're standing between the two of them. You're about 40 and 40 meters from the two most radioactive areas in the world, um, kind of. Um, and you're getting about twice what you would on a beach in Brazil. So not particularly dangerous. My mum disagrees. She thinks it's the worst place and I should never go. Um, OK, so this is Fukushima Daiichi from above. Um, and there is some work to be done. And that work could well last over 100 years. The first job was to cool the reactors, uh, stop that reaction, uh, keep them cool, stop them remelting, and then moving around inside the basements again. And that's been done. That is currently being done. They're, pump they're still pumping water into it. The second thing they had to do was make the site safe. You're going to have an awful lot of people working there, construction workers, engineers, electricians, you name it. Everybody works there. There's an awful lot of staff that work there full time. So you have to make the whole site as safe as possible. The area you can't make perfectly safe is the reactors themselves. The other thing you have to do is you have to remove the spent fuel from the spent fuel pools. They've achieved that in reactor number four, but they have yet to do it for one, two, and three. The other thing they have to do is they have to find where the molten fuel is. You can only remove it if you know where it is. And that's, that's kind of been done, uh, but not entirely. Each one of those reactors has about 90 tons of uranium. And when it's molten, it's, it flows very quickly. And if there's any nooks and crannies in the basement, it will go there. They then have to remove the fuel. Nobody's ever done it before. Uh, it hasn't been done in Chernobyl, which was 30 years ago. They're not even close to doing it in Fukushima. And the last thing you have to do is you have to decontaminate a very, very large area, not just the site itself, but the surrounding area. You've had to evacuate something like 300,000 people from the area, and a lot of them haven't come back. The population has dropped. Uh, Fukushima, as a, as a, as a county, uh, it, it's, it's in trouble, and not just because of the radioactive fallout. A lot of young people have left. They've gotten jobs in other cities. They're not coming back. Um, so, yeah, it would be interesting to see how Japan copes with, copes with that. Um, you may well also have heard of the contaminated water. It's been in the press a lot, and it's a concern for people. The radioactivity is leaking some of it into the ocean, although very, very small quantities are actually leaking into the ocean. And what happens is you have natural groundwater. It's raining. Uh, Japan's very mountainous. You have a lot of mountains, and then the mountains level out, and then you have a little strip of where you can live and where you can build stuff. 
So a lot of groundwater is running down and it comes into the reactor building because these are built below ground level. The water flows in, it gets mixed up with a lot of the fuel and the other debris inside, then it flows out. This was not acceptable to the Japanese people. Um, so they decided to build an ice wall. So around the whole perimeter, a very large area, they dug 30 meter deep holes and they froze the ground into one solid block of ice to try and prevent groundwater from leaking in. It's relatively effective. On the day of the accident and the first few weeks after, they had to use, they, they were, the contaminated water was 900 tons a day of contaminated water. Now it's about 150. So the ice wall isn't perfect, but it's, it's very, very good. And here's the installation of these frozen pipes and a chap performing a very high tech test of hitting it to see if it's frozen. Uh, however, when you have a lot of this contaminated water, you can filter out almost everything. The only thing you can't filter out is um, tritiated water. So heavy, the H3, um, the heavy uh, isotope of hydrogen. It's mildly radioactive. It doesn't bioaccumulate. So if you were to drink it, it would basically pass right through you. Uh, has a half-life of around 30 years. It's not particularly dangerous, but the Japanese fishing uh, industry and the people are not too happy with the idea of it being released. Even though most experts um, in uh, nuclear remediation and safety would tell you it's actually probably safer to release that contaminated water on a day-by-day -day basis and not to release it all at once. Um, because you're gonna have to keep building these tanks and these areas in red are all these tanks. And some of these tanks are you know, half a million liter tanks, absolutely full of this stuff. Um, so when I last went to Japan, I went with a UK delegation and they said the best thing to do would be to release it day by day. But it's a hard sell to, to people who were initially uh, lied to by TEPCO. TEPCO wasn't always particularly honest. So the people are hesitant. Their approval of, say, of nuclear was around 70% before the accident. Now it's dropped to about 15%. So people aren't particularly happy there. Uh, in terms of the radioactivity in the water, um, first of all, I'll bring your attention that this is a log scale. And along the bottom, we've got uh, time since the accident. And here we're looking at cesium, cesium-134 and cesium-137. These are particularly concerned for uh, for, bio, for, for human interaction. And these uh, dashed lines tell you what is the Japanese government safety level. So you could quite easily uh, eat fish uh, anywhere in Japan which is below that level. So very quickly, after about six months, the radioactivity in the water, and this is only about 20 meters from the plant, the radioactivity is actually very low. Um, so I'm often asked whether we should be concerned with radioactivity leaking into the ocean, and, and not, not in the slightest. You know, the ocean is incredibly big, and the, you dissolve a lot of that. Uh, you don't dissolve it, sorry, you... you um, what's the word I'm looking for? You dilute it, yeah, you dilute it uh, so much that it really isn't much of a concern. And all of the fish in Fukushima is, is, is safe to eat. The only one that they're still limiting the sale on um, is bottom-feeding fish because some of those fish happened to consume some of the particles that fell into the ocean. But otherwise, quite a safe place to go for a swim. Uh, the other thing that they've had to do, and they've had to do a lot of, is they've had to clean up the site. Uh, you're going to have to do a lot of work there. There's going to be a lot of machinery moving around, so you have to make it as safe as possible. So these are some before and after pictures uh, where they've removed most of the rubble, including a, a bus from the basement of one of the buildings. Uh, so when you go there now, um, it actually doesn't look like a disaster site. It looks like a, a big construction site, really. So that's, uh, yeah. So here is um, reactor number two here. And it, here you can get very, very close to it. This is a UK uh, delegation who went to visit recently. And what they've done is they've covered the whole site in concrete. They've sprayed it uh, about uh, a foot thick to keep most of that dust and radioactive dust down. They've completely fixed the seawall, uh, and they've designed all of this in mind should another earthquake or a tsunami hit. So the whole process has to still be able to occur should this, this unthinkably large earthquake happen again. 
Uh, the last picture is a picture of the uniforms that you have to wear. So if you are in the green zone, which is you know, a good 90% of the site, you can get away with just a, a, a mask and just normal clothing. This is normal clothing that you'd wear at a nuclear site. Only if you go very close to the reactor sites, which are here, do you have to wear uh, overalls. And if you visit like I did uh, a few times, you, um, you just go on as you are. You don't have to wear anything. No gloves, no shoe covers, nothing. But they're getting there, and they are working very, very hard to get there. And I've just got a little video to show you uh, what they've done. They've removed all of the fuel uh, from the spent fuel pool of unit number four. A milestone, a milestone is being reached in the recovery of Fukushima Daiichi. For the first time since the accident, spent fuel will be removed from the damaged building and stored in a safer, more secure way in these specially designed containers. Moving the spent fuel out of the damaged reactor building and into safe permanent storage lays the groundwork for moving forward with mediation of the damaged building. So that's, uh, that's you know, good news. That's great work. Um, but it was the easiest one to do. Uh, it, was, it was challenging, but there wasn't, an exp there wasn't any uh, radioactivity uh, within reactor number four. So not an easy job, but not the most difficult one. So they have picked the easiest ones first. And the good, thing, uh, the good thing about fixing a nuclear disaster is that um, the longer you wait, uh, the better, because a lot of the radioactive material dies away. But you don't want to wait too long, because a lot of this infrastructure is starting to age. You know, these sites, are, these buildings are 50, 60 years old. So if you wait too long, they could crumble or they could collapse, and they've been damaged by the earthquake. So you have to balance uh, those two things. But they're getting there for unit number three. So this is 2011, just after the accident, uh, no roof. Uh, 2016, they've cleaned the roof up completely and they're starting to build uh, a base on which they will build a new fuel handling machine and big crane to remove that fuel from the spent fuel pool. And they're gonna have to um, hermetically seal the whole building. And the danger is that when they're removing some of this fuel, some of it's gonna be damaged. And if that gets into the atmosphere, the operators are going to be exposed to it. So the whole building is going to be sealed from the environment should there be some kind of an accident. Uh, and this is last month, so you can go and have a walk around the top of it, and 30 meters below you is the, the remainder of the molten fuel from, from the core. During the earthquake, the earthquake was so powerful, that big refueling crane I showed you, um, it fell into the spent fuel pool. That's, that's bad news because it will have damaged a lot of the spent fuel. It would have bent it and warped it. So when you try and remove it, you could scratch it open. Uh, you could bend it. So nobody really knows what the, spent the state <laughs> of the spent fuel pool is. So whilst it's relatively easy um, to do compared to fixing the cores themselves, uh, not an easy job by any means. And this is an absolutely enormous crane lifting a huge crane out of the, out of the building. So this spent fuel pool is now ready for, uh, for cleanup. The problem is they have uh, a lot of rubble, a lot of concrete which has fallen into the pool. Uh, so for context, that little handle that you see is probably about that big. Uh, so really sizable bits of rubble. And the danger is a lot of that rubble would have fallen in between the gaps. And then when you, when you were drawing it, those rocks and that rubble can split all of that um, fuel open, and then you've got radiation release. Yeah, and so for context, that's about the size of these, uh, these fuel bundles that you have. So pretty big. And about 300 uh, kilograms each. OK, so now some pretty exciting video. Uh, for me and for you. I think you'll love it. Um, we are going to go inside uh, reactor unit number three and we're going to go through this beautifully designed valve. So here we are. We're now going into an area called the PCV, which houses the reactor um, and the control rods. This is what six years of uh, water and salt water is going to do. You're going to corrode. Normally, when you go to a nuclear power station and you walk inside this area very close to the reactor, it's like an operating theater. It's incredibly clean. It's very, very tidy. Um, but in here, not so much. And those white sparkles you can see is that's radiation on the, on the camera itself. And here's a robot designed by Hitachi called Little Sunfish. And is going for a swim inside the water, which is being still pumped in there to keep the fuel cool. 
So here, you can see some of this orange material, uh, and the estimate is that that is uh, nuclear material, uh, which was sprayed out of the core. Nobody is absolutely certain, but that's the most likely candidate. So this robot swam around for a couple of hours. Um, it's very disorientating, and they had to call in a lot of the uh, chaps who used to work there and they'd sit them all around a room and they were like, do you recognize that staircase? Do you know where that thing used to be? To try and build up an idea of exactly where is this robot? Because it's really difficult to know where that robot is because the whole building is designed to keep radiation in, so you can't transmit your position. So it's really hard to know where is the robot. And the only way you can really do it is by collating these images together. So there's some important results that came out of it. Um, these are some of the areas that can house the control rods. They're rusted, but they're generally in pretty good shape. There's a lot of accumulation of rock and rubble, which is possibly a material called corium. Now, corium is a very loosely defined term, and it's uh, core material and concrete. When core material, uh, uranium meets concrete, it uh, chemically interacts, and you produce this very messy, um, heterogeneous material. So that could be what we're looking at there. This is one of the bottom of the control rods. Uh, and the fact that you've got orange material around the bolts could mean that the fuel has actually um, burned its way through the control rods and is dripping down into the basement. And the other thing is you've got a lot of corrosion. You know, six years of water um, is going to cause a lot of rust and a lot of corrosion. <coughs> this is a concern. Um, because if you try and bring in some kind of a robot to do some of the cleaning up, if that robot sits on something very rusty, it could fall. So you don't really know whether a lot of your structures can take uh, much weight or not. Um, a picture of some sludge. Um, very radioactive sludge. Um, this is most likely a mixture of uranium and steel and all the other material that's melted inside the reactor. And it's burned away a lot of the floor, um, and normally a corrugated steel floor. So these are pretty recent results. And normally, like you saw this picture before, this area is very, very nice and very clean, a nice floor to stand on. And this is what it looks like today. Uh, these are the tops of the control rods. This should be a floor, but the floor looks like it's melted away. So that gives us some indication that the temperature inside there got very, very hot. So it's more than likely that the fuel has fallen down into the basement. OK, I'm going to show you a video now. It's a little disorientating, because what happened is they took many, many, many pictures. It's um, the world's most expensive selfie stick. It's, it's, a, it's essentially a robotic arm with a camera on the end, and that camera photographs in all sorts of different directions. And they've combined it into um, one image. So we're going to now have a look at uh, an inspection which happened last week, some very recent results. Uh, so here we are. We're looking upwards. So we're now looking into the control rods. You can see most of them are in good shape. These wires have burned away from the temperature. There's a big hole over here, which could be where a large amount of material fell through the reactor core. Um, so nobody, nobody really knows exactly what happened. A lot of people have tried to model these, these, um, this melting process, how the, the, the fuel interacts inside the reactor core, but nobody really knows. But so here's that picture of that sludge again. And there should be floor here, and there should be floor here and here. So a lot of the floor has fallen away. So initially, people thought, well, we'll drive a robot in, and then the robot can take some pictures. But you can't drive a robot on that stuff. But maybe, maybe you will one day. Um, you know, the government, the Japanese government has said, we'll fix it within 40 years. If you talk to anybody uh, offline, you know, afterwards, they're like, it's going to be a lot more than 40 years. So possibly 100 years worth of work. Uh, a job for life in, uh, in Fukushima. Um, OK, the next bit, I was particularly impressed with these results. These are actually quite amazing. This is in the basement. So this is the very lowest level of the buildings. This is in reactor number two. Uh, so you have the reactor here. You have the control rods. You have the floor, which you just saw. Now this is the basement. And the idea is that there's 90 tons worth of fuel somewhere, somewhere here. 
So again, a slightly disorientating video, but not too bad. So this is looking directly down onto the floor, and you can see a lot of uh, pebbles and rubble. Normally that wouldn't be in there. So that gives us an idea that possibly a lot of this fuel was sprayed out under very high pressure, uh, and in so doing reacted possibly with the, with the concrete. This machine here, this is a machine which replaces control rods. Uh, that looks in relatively good condition. There's a bit of floor which has fallen away. The rest of it looks generally quite good shape. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what this area is, but it's possibly a thing called a drain sump, which is basically a, um, a hole in the ground to soak up some water if you've got a leak inside. So yeah, very impressive results when I saw them and very recent as well. So this is in reactor number two. Numbers one, one is going to be the worst because it um, had no cooling for well over a day. So that's probably going to be the one which is, the, which is the, in the worst physical condition. And unit three is underwater, and you saw that video of that earlier. Um, so nobody quite knows what that, that looks like because the water is very dirty. Uh, so you can't have a look inside. But we do have some idea of what we might find when we actually go inside the reactors themselves. There was a uh, comparatively a minor accident in Three Mile Island. And uh, there it's a different type of reactor, but essentially the same thing. And the reactor lost cooling and it started to melt. So when they finally opened it up in 1984, um, they saw that some of these fuel assemblies had become warped and bent uh, under the high temperature. That was the first thing that we will find in Fukushima probably. The uh, second thing is some of the fuel rods would have scattered around inside. Um, thirdly, this rubble bed of this mixture of steel and uranium and any other material inside the reactor, it's all molten into this big mess. Uh, I haven't told you a single thing about what it is that I actually do for my job. Um, this is the reason why we're involved. You can use acoustic imaging to try and build up an idea of what the core looks like inside or in the water. And that's, that's kind of how I got into this, this whole work. Um, and lastly, there's uh, we big lumps, pebbles of, of mixture of material. And we expect to see a lot of that. And we found about 50 tons of it in, um, in Three Mile Island. And this, that was a bit smaller than the one in uh, Fukushima. So we expect similar stuff, similar stuff to have happened. What are they going to do? Well, at some point, they're going to have to remove all this material. Uh, easier said than done. Nobody's ever done it before. Um, so they spent a long time trying to come up with some uh, process to do that. The Japanese government put them under considerable pressure, uh, possibly more pressure than they should have been under, because you don't want to make decisions like this too quickly. And they came up with three possible solutions. One is let's flood the whole building. Uh, and then we're going to have a crane that's just going to pick out piece by piece and we'll, la we'll laser cut and we'll chop and we'll just remove it all piece by piece, possibly over 40, 50 years. The problem with that is that the earthquake um, fractured the concrete, so there's an awful lot of leaks inside the building itself. So you'd have to keep pumping water in and then the water is going to leak out, so then you've got more contaminated water to deal with. So this was not chosen. The second one was, well, why don't we try and do it dry from the top? Uh, the problem with that is that you have to build a very heavy crane which is going to sit on top of the building. The problem with that is that the building could well be very damaged, so you can't use that approach either, so that was rejected. The final one they're going to use is uh, they're going to cut a hole in the side of the building, and then they're going to use essentially a digger and some kind of mechanical system to remove a lot of this fuel. This, at the moment, is just a diagram. This is as far as they've come, really, with proposing how they're going to remove a lot of this fuel. So the timeline is very long, and a lot of these technologies have yet to be developed. But the one thing that they have done is they've developed a lot of interesting robots to do that. Uh, this one, which I'm particularly uh, sort of a, uh, well acquainted with, is a shape-changing robot. Some of these reactors have very small access, so this robot changes shape. You put it in a thin, uh, in a narrow tube, and then it, once it's inside, it changes shape and it can move around. They've got normal diggers and uh, a swimming robot. It looks like a snake. That's pretty cool. Um, I'm not entirely sure where they're going to deploy that. The other thing they've got is they've got uh, very expensive clean hoovers. Uh, which pick up a lot of the dust and material inside the building, so when they eventually go inside, they can clean a lot of that up. 
So at this point, I think it's important to put this accident in context. The other nuclear accident, which we're all possibly familiar with, either professionally or we're aware of the, the, the name anyway, is the Chernobyl accident, which happened in 1986. Chernobyl, this is the uh, map to scale, same size. And Chernobyl was landlocked, essentially, and it spewed a lot of radioactive material over a very large area. Possibly around 10 times more radiation was released from Chernobyl than it was from Fukushima. So Fukushima, comparatively, is a lot smaller. And uh, it's difficult to estimate how many people would have lost their lives from Chernobyl. The best estimates are around 4,000 people will have a life cut short by the Chernobyl accident. Uh, with Fukushima, it's a different story. It's quite possibly going to be a lot less than that. Um, and the reason is because the evacuation was better carried out. And also, one of the uh, big causes of deaths in uh, Chernobyl was that people would absorb some of the radioactive material in their thyroid gland. And a lot of that is because they were malnourished, so their body would suck that up as soon as possible. That's why you're given iodine pills to stop that happening. In Fukushima, uh, people are very well nourished, so their body has no particular reason to absorb a lot of this material. And Professor Philip Thomas at the university has done a lot of work on uh, what's going to happen as a result of what happened in Fukushima from a health point of view. And the best estimate is that quite likely nobody's actually going to die from Fukushima. Um, it's a contentious issue for a lot of people. Um, Certainly nobody died from acute radiation poisoning or anything like that. The radiation, the maximum radiation received by any of the workers was no higher than 100 millisieverts for the, uh, the, the technical people in the room. So from that point of view, uh, obviously a serious accident, and there has been around 2,000 people who died as a result of the evacuation. Uh, so a lot of older people in Japan, they were moved, and that, that's a lot of stress. Uh, it, in, it introduces bad habits, you know, not sleeping properly, eating too much, drinking too much. Suicide is also a problem. So it's, it's a serious issue, um, but we should keep it in mind. The other thing we should uh, keep in mind is how dangerous other types of energy generation are. This is the deaths per kilowatt hour. Uh, so coal, one of the biggest killers for people who uh, work in the coal industry, people who transport it, mine it. Um, the radiation, the, the uh, material which is released during the combustion of coal, that's bad, it's pollution, it's bad for your lungs, that will kill you as well. Oil's pretty bad, hydroelectric dams, they have had habits of bursting, that kills a lot of people. Uh, solar, uh, the reason solar's in there is because there's a big increase in the amount of solar uh, energy being installed, and that means a lot more cars on the road, a lot more trucks, a lot more people installing solar panels on roofs, a lot of people falling from roofs. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. If you're gonna want to get some energy, you're gonna have to pay some kind of a price. And it just so happens that from a, from a, a death point of view, um, actually nuclear has one of the highest and the best safety records of all of them. So again, it's, it's worth keeping in mind. Uh, so what's the impact of the, uh, the accident in Japan and, and, and more globally? Well, in Japan, there was a dramatic drop in nuclear power uh, support. People weren't particularly happy. Japan also turned all their nuclear power plants off. They've turned a few of them back on. And because they turned them all off, they had to buy a lot of natural gas from Russia. So now they're burning a lot of natural gas, producing more um, carbon dioxide. So that's not great. Um, a lot of people were evacuated. Like I said, I think, I think it was it's either 150,000 or 300,000 people were evacuated. I think 150,000 were ordered to evacuate, but a lot more people chose to evacuate because they were, they were quite scared, understandably. The other societal impact is uh, large um, mental health issues for the, the people who were, ver were evacuated. The environmental aspect, this is in Fukushima. Uh, it's, it's amazing. It, I've been now three or four times, and every time I go, Japan's in the tropics. It's, it's, it's quite incredible to see just how quickly nature is starting to reclaim a lot of these land and areas where people don't live. Um, so the, the environmental uh, point, like I said, it's about 10% of what happened with Chernobyl, and that's a very well documented and very well understood event, so we can learn something from what happened in Chernobyl. Um, health effects. Um, 
I'm not an expert in health physics uh, by any means, and this is what I've been able to glean from, from experts in, in the field. Around 2,300 people who did die, but not directly as a result of the accident. Nobody had acute radiation sickness, so that's certainly a positive. Um, and the best projection, it's very difficult to diagnose the, the future health of, an, of a nation when you have low levels of radiation, um, is that it's going to have a, a minimal impact, um, is, is what I've been able to, to read. Finally, well, what's the uh, industrial impact uh, globally and, and in Japan? Um, Japan was 30% nuclear powered, it's now 4%. So like I said, you have to compensate for that somehow. The whole process is estimated to cost about $500,000 million. Uh, that's about 10% of Japan's GDP. So it's expensive, that's gonna cost you a lot of money to fix. But on the plus side, um, stress tests were carried out at similar plants directly afterwards. So all the nuclear power plants around the world they learned a lesson from Japan, and the, the lesson was you have an incredibly rare earthquake and then you have an incredibly rare tsunami. What happens when we have them both happen at the same time? Because if either of those had happened, they would have been fine. But the fact that two happened at the same time um, means they weren't. And also there was negligence on the behalf of the, of the Japanese, undoubtedly. Okay, so with that, um, this is a picture of me in Japan. Uh, at the first, uh, the whole reason I am here um, is because the UK has had a long history of nuclear power with Japan. We sold them the first ever nuclear reactor, um, and they trust us to do good work, so I'm here doing good work. Um, and if you would like to have a little bit more of a technical idea of what's going on, uh, recently Bruce and I were asked to write an article for Physics World, uh, What Next for Fukushima? And if you'd like to read a little something on your way home, please come and grab a coffee, uh, a copy. And with that, I thank you very much for listening. And hopefully, we can have some questions. <laughs>